how we have expanded and what we have learned from, from that. So about myself, uh, actually today is the fifth birthday exactly of Garage 48, which was mentioned here. So it's the hackathon started uh, from Estonia and now have been about over 40 hackathons, I think in 16 countries in Africa, Middle East, uh, Eastern Europe and all of that. So whenever you have a chance, take, uh, take part of it. That it's, an, it's an amazing uh, experience. So about my group, uh, uh, I'm seems to be a bit similar as Oleg was speaking. So I have done lots of ventures within the last 15 years. I have studied business. I uh, started my first company during un the university and it was uh, exited in, the, in two years. And then it was listed in Tallinn Stock Exchange. It went bankrupt in one year. Then I went to, to work at Tallinn Stock Exchange, Skype and so on. So have been some of the corporate so jobs and uh, some of the startups quite much, quite much mixed. In Skype I was dealing with the self-service part which was actually where we charged uh, money. Uh, from uh, from customers, all the credit card payments, self-service, my account, all of that part. Grew it from uh, four people in start to about 30 people uh, within one and a half years and from Tallinn to four different offices and, uh, and so on. And regarding community part, uh, I'm one of the founders of Estonian Startup Leaders Club. I think it's Estonia is one of the only countries where all all the main founders belong into the one uh, club. We have one Skype chat with 60 members. So basically all Estonian founders are basically there. So whenever you have a question in three or five minutes, five guys will, will answer your questions, share comments, contacts, say that this VC sucks or this lawyer is super good. So all of that works quite well. So, so yeah, and the Estonian mafia hashtag has also grown out from there. So. So yeah, I think Estonian community is pretty good and uh, we have been also supporting Tech Hub and I see that Latvian startup community is also growing and Garage 48 has, has been trying to help this to grow a bit. And uh, yeah, today I'm co-founder and expansion manager of Taxify, so uh, I'll talk more about that. So how much you have tried Taxify or you know what it is? Okay see about half people. Cool. So uh, we are a mobile app and uh, our aim is that uh, people could order their transportation very easily and uh, usually it should be like two, three clicks. And uh, here the screenshots uh, demonstrate that we just uh, last week um, launched in-app payments, uh, which means that uh, here uh, on top of the page, or so basically the first page, you just define your location. Second page, you can choose cars. And now we added the new section which is payment methods. So you can filter if the car, in car you can pay in cash or card, or you can add your credit card and basically then it's very convenient option. So you just choose a car, you say thanks to the, after the ride, you step out and you get the invoice to your email. So, so that's pretty cool. So the feedback from customers is, is really good, they love it. So uh, maybe there is a question that why should I switch over from calling uh, to the dispatcher? So uh, here I thought there are like three main points. So first thing is that it's very quick and easy. So uh, at least in Tallinn, there is big problem. We have about 30 different companies. The quality is pretty different. And in peak time, it's really a problem to order taxi. We see that the Riga, the situation is a bit different because you have uh, three, four bigger fleets and then a bunch of small companies then you usually never know how is the quality. So uh, we try to make the quality like good. So our vision is that all the cars you take in Taxify, they are all good. So there shouldn't be a shitty car. So if it's shitty, then uh, we try to get it out and it's all based on the user ratings and feedback. So we really monitor that. So yeah, uh, first thing is that uh, easy and fast. You just tap your location. You choose the closest car, you can choose it by price, rating, car, model. So whenever you want to fancy a girlfriend, you can take a premium car. Whenever you need a quick and cheap ride, you take the cheapest one. So whatever the situation is, you always find the closest car really fast and, and easily. Then you see the car arriving on the map. So when you order from a dispatch, you never know when the guy is going. Maybe he's stuck in the, in the traffic or whatever it is. So in our case, you see it clearly coming on the map, exactly as it's here on the poster. 
you see the car coming, you can step out in a second. So you don't need to uh, wait outside uh, and be in the cold unless you want to do a smoke. So uh, yeah, that's the thing. And now the third point is the in-app payments. So that don't hassle with cash. I have taken several times rides in Riga. I give the guy five or uh, 10 euros. The guy has no exchange. So what should I do? Then he drives away to some gas station, tries to exchange money, then brings back me the money. So it's a huge hassle. So yeah, that's why we believe that the cashless payments are really the convenient thing and that's the future. So try it out and see how it works. And finally, we currently have a pricing campaign. Maybe you have seen in bus stops, but currently you can take Taxify cheaper than public transport. So take five or six kilometer ride, you get it less than two euros, which is the ticket for public transport. So that's the introductory campaign. We are just showing people how easy it is to use Taxify and how well it works. And we'll see if the feedback is really good, maybe we keep it over the summer. So it depending how much you want to take the rides. Yep. Okay. Okay, cool. So uh, about the fundamentals, what we are building, what is Taxify? It's actually a marketplace. We have two sides. On one side we have drivers, the other side we have uh, riders. So this part might seem that it's very cool, it's online, it's internet, it's sexy. On the other side, it's fucking online, offline business. It means that, see these guys, they are like total variety of the society. You have like guys like that driving Ladas. You have guys like that thinking that they are the king. We have guys who are trying to provide premium service. So it's like a really hassle to get all of these guys into one service. Most of the guys who join us, they make email first time. They haven't seen smartphone. So it's, uh, it's like real education program to get all of these guys into the system, then accept the orders. They go out to smoke, they forget to put that they are busy, order comes in, no one is re responding. So all of these kind of things we need to do. So, so yeah, that's why on one, th one hand we are online business, on the other hand we are total offline business. So we need like to coach all of these thousands of guys in each country, they are all different and all of that. So, so yeah, online and offline, customers and drivers, you need to balance them all of the same time. And uh, if you have too many customers, too uh, few drivers, customers are unhappy. If you have the opposite way, few customers, many riders, uh, drivers go away, say you don't have orders. So it's a big hassle to get the whole marketplace working and, and of course to keep the quality up, we need both sides. We need good drivers and we need good customers and both of them can, can rate each other. So we constantly monitor the ratings and we wanna kick out the bad guys and give more work to the good drivers. So that's how the economy works. So that uh, if you give us feedback for your ride, then that helps actually better drivers to get better feedback and more rides and so on. So the scammers go out, the good guys get a tie and provide the best service. Uh, so how we started uh, with a failure. So uh, we tried to get uh, funding initially from Enterprise Estonia, which is the government institution. We failed because they are saying that we are a transport provider and they don't support that. It's European regulations, they can't uh, support transport companies. Okay, what do we do? Then we found the family. Uh, I put in money, parents put in money, and uh, me and Markus, we are the two co-founders. Uh, we found initial cash, we found a freelance developer, built the prototype with Corona. As it was also discussed, it was quite sluggy, slow, all of that, not native. But at least we could go on the street and start talking to the drivers. Of course, first drivers were really hesitant of doing that. They also said that there have been apps in Tallinn before. Two apps, the guys were dying because they couldn't push it through. Whatever the problem was, timing and so on. So what we did, we just uh, took the bike and drove all the places where taxis are standing as on one hand it was a good training, on the other hand we talked to hundreds of drivers and of course in all segments you get like 5 or 10% early adopters who would get these guys on board and then started to grow there. So uh, and of course we also got some early adopter users but as the product was really bad, lots of bugs, they were not happy. So it was our lucky day, one like uh, 
developer approached us, said that I want to join you. Give me like third of the company. We, we were really hesitant. Okay, who are you? Why should we take you? We took some beers, had a discussion for like three, four times, and we thought that, okay, he's a decent guy. He saved our company. Today, uh, or basically in September uh, 2013, he rewrote the whole product and the whole platform within one month. We launched in October. Has been a growth like that. So we have had uh, no big failures, no uh, crashes, nothing like that after that. So the product is really scalable and we could say that that was definitely our lucky day that we got that guy. If we would have continued with a freelance developer, we would have been dead by the end of the year. And uh, regarding the technology, as I'm not really the technology guy, I just uh, know that we use Node.js, uh, PHP as uh, backend and admin side, MySQL databases, and now uh, the apps on Android and iOS are native on, uh, on Windows Phone. Uh, we use a container and web-based uh, stuff. Ah, by the way, if you have questions, you're welcome to ask. I try to answer them right away. So, uh, where we are today? Uh, in January 2014, uh, you can see that uh, we started pretty slow in Estonia. We got first uh, micro round of from, in, uh, from Angels. It was about 70,000 euros. And that helped us to, uh, to open operations in Latvia. And uh, after that, uh, also Lithuania and, uh, and Finland. And today uh, we are the leader in the Baltics, so we cover all four countries. Um, we are doing more than 150,000 rides a month and the cities are growing quite well, about 15% uh, monthly. Uh, we have about, uh, or we have over 30 employees today in eight countries. So the setup is so that in each country, in each country or city we have two people. One is the country manager running the business marketing finances and all operations side and the other person is the driver manager who goes out smoking and talking to these guys, coaching and all of that. So, so to keep this uh, bunch of colorful guys in the system, keeping the quality, making them pay invoices and all the fun part. And uh, by end of the year we uh, raised another round, so the total funding is uh, 1.45 million. Uh, the round was was led by Rubylight, who are the guys from Adna Klasnik and what was also discussed before. It's also TMT from London, AdCash is the uh, global ad network and, uh, and also several angels from different backgrounds from Singapore to, uh, to Finland to Estonia and Baltics. Um, so uh, where we stand today regarding countries. So of course we we conquered Baltics in the, in the first place, then we went to Finland. Finland actually is a pretty big country, so as you can see there are like, we are even in quite north in Rovaniemi where the Santa Claus lives, in Oulu in Helsinki and all that part. So the bigger European launches we went to Amsterdam to really fight with Uber. Uh, also in Helsinki we launched in uh, November during the slush, the big conference time. We got to the news that Uber wanted to launch at the same time, but we managed to get all their cars. So even today they don't have any cars in Helsinki. Uh, and uh, similar fights in, uh, in Amsterdam. And uh, regarding um, other areas then, we have partners in Barcelona. Uh, we have cool partners in Georgia at Pilisi. And now we are expanding uh, into Polish, Serbian, Hungary and, in, and these countries which are currently in preparation phase. Uh, so, who are our customers or, or stakeholders in our business? So, these guys you already know, they are the fun guys. Uh, then we have the users, uh, they are also fun and they are the majority of our customers. Then we have the taxi company managers, they are also quite fun, they really like their brands, they don't want to cooperate with anyone, they think that they will rule uh, the whole city and all of that part, so it's really fun to meet and talk to these guys try to say that uh, maybe it's time to choose some cool technology or, or maybe the market is changing. So uh, those are always very fun meetings. Then we have uh, local guys uh, like Yuris who is running our businesses in different countries. And uh, then we have dispatchers. So we also have solution for taxi companies that they can, they can use dispatching service also compared to radios that most of the companies in Eastern Europe do today. And then we have 
cloud-based central system that connects all of these parts. Uh, so uh, regarding systems, we have uh, customer-facing applications. Uh, they are currently in uh, three platforms plus the web application, so you can also order in the web. Uh, we have driver applications in two platforms, Android and uh, iPhone. Uh, then we have the dispatch solution and uh, some companies also do the VoIP integration so that whenever you call a dispatcher the number appears right away there, all your order history and all that stuff comes in there. And what we have seen is that compared to radio we can reduce the order processing time from about 30, 40 seconds to about uh, 4 or 5 seconds. So uh, we have companies uh, who have reduced their dis so basically same time dispatching uh, ladies from uh, four on peak hours to two. So 50% reduce of the manpower and on the same time uh, making about one and a half time more orders. So for them it's like a clear efficiency what we see that we can do with our technology. And then, of course, we have the back office uh, systems and admin. A uh, taxi company has a dashboard to see their statistics and their drivers and all of that stuff. And the newest part is that we also introduce service to corporate customers. They have real-time access to the, uh, to the rides and the information and, and configuration, what and how much their employees do rides, if they need to set any limit, that people and so on. Uh, so. That's a, that's a quick look of uh, the daily stuff in one city. So uh, here is the legend of how it meals. But basically the yellow guys are customers. These are free taxis. Uh, these are taxis that are taking some ride with the customers. And the violet ones are taxis who are busy outside of our system taking some other users, not our app rides. So uh, yeah, we also have quite a lot of data and we still don't know too much how, what to do with it. We are digging from, from one side a bit and trying to analyze, but we have much more data than we are capable of using like smartly today. So uh, how we develop stuff? Um, we have like tons of ideas as usually, as w it was discussed, the Pareto method that 80-20. So we try to research, uh, talk to customers, uh, plan and prioritize, try to really understand what brings the most value to the customers and then try to build that stuff. Uh, so on the development side, usability is the key thing. Uh, so the system must be simple uh, and work really well. So we do tons of iterations with uh, all kinds of changes and, and uh, flow things. We do user testing. We see how users uh, use it when they get stuck and whatever. We do the flows, we start from paper, then we do online prototypes and so on. And we do that constantly even today whenever we introduce new features. Then we need to build the stuff uh, for server side, then all the apps and uh, then testing side. And it would be nice if we could develop all the platforms same time. It's a dream world, reality is a bit different. So some of the platforms are lagging behind. Then we do internal testing. We have like table full of devices that uh, we want to use, different mix of configurations. I'll tell about these challenges a bit later on. Uh, then we do external testing. We have beta testers among the users, beta testers among uh, drivers, and they all have different uh, devices and the location part as well. So we launch usually services uh, so that they operate in one country but not in another. So that makes the whole testing part uh, a bit more challenging. Then we uh, publish and then do the upgrades. There are also s challenges if you have developed apps, you know that people don't upgrade right away. Then you have user base divided between different versions and all of that. That creates some of the challenges and so on. And if you, if you roll out critical stuff, then it's smart to roll it out gradually to some part of the users, like 5%, <coughs> 10%. And uh, then if you see that the feedback is good, there are no big crashes, then you can roll it out bigger on. But you can, that do, you can do that currently, or we currently do that on Android. On iOS, you can't do that, so due to that system. And then, uh, of course, we need to build user guides, uh, support stuff, uh, have act active feedback sessions, and if it's some really cool and bigger features, then we try to get PR and all of that as well. And that's from country to country, how we how we need to handle that. So, um, 
regarding the challenges so as I told you that uh, usually there are like a bunch of guys who are on the latest version then on the previous version then older versions and then some guys on a totally outdated version so if you, if you launch a product within two years you have definitely some part of guys who never up, update for whatever reason so so you need to manage the configuration and all of that part so so uh, maybe one year ago we didn't support some of the features or you want to upgrade some of the server side stuff for synchronization location improvements bring in new features so you basically have to manage all of this kind of mix and the same way on driver side so if you if you launch a mobile game then usually you have one side but on our side we have the other party which is the drivers so we need to have a compatibility list of that version and 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 that version so basically it's like uh, quite a hell of configuration to make sure that they all work with each other and uh, if we add one more layer which is countries so in one country we have one set of services live in other countries it's another so making that test work and reliable it is a bit of a challenge but uh, so far so good and uh, we are still alive um, so uh, regarding the apps so this is just one flow of uh, adding the credit card payments uh, to the uh, to the application so we needed to change the the sign up flow initially we only ask for a mobile phone number to authenticate the user via the sending a pin code and making sure that the person writing the number actually owns the number so it initially it was that when we started to introduce mobile payments we needed to get your name and uh, email address as well in order to send you receipts by email and in order to uh, for credit card payments we also need the name data so that uh, in that sense we needed to to change the sign up flow we needed to add uh, new parts of adding the credit card uh, all the processing and all of that so we did several cycles of of this kind of iteration and then we are we are in a stage today that we are launching it but we are not fully happy yet so we continue checking the feedback and all of that to make it more smooth and 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 working and of course we need to support this in in all the main platforms so today we have launched it in uh, Android and uh, iOS platforms and in Windows it's still developing so hopefully coming up within uh, within a few weeks uh, and uh, yeah so when you when you introduce some kind of new features so initially our core feature was that uh, people can uh, choose cars now based on the feedback we are seeing that actually for some people it's cool for some people it's not that cool so most people still want to get a car and uh, they want to get a decent car so when we are able to provide a decent car to all of the customers then they don't want to choose car one by one so because it happens that you order the first car the guy is uh, not responding so you need to choose the another one order again so the wor workflow goes quite bad and not that convenient especially if you have had few drinks as well so it might be fun but in the end it's still like a hassle so we are now moving into the direction that we introduce categories so that its price category is eco which is really cheap cars standard middle class and then um, the premium ones so basically you choose the category and based on on that we get you the closest car and then you are sure you get the good experience and of course it all needs to be as simple as possible so that people wouldn't get lost in uh, in this whole flow and of course on bottom line you need to have the fleet that is reliable that is actually coming the guys are not smelling and all of that so there are like really different layers of the services to actually make the whole experience work so we could potentially think that we are just the app and we don't care about the drivers so we just send the order to the driver and what happens afterwards is is not our business but what we have seen is that actually customers take the whole from A to Z experience as Taxify experience so that must be all good so we need to work with uh, with the drivers and all of that so we need to be cool from A to Z the whole experience should be really rocking uh, here are just a few examples of the different versions what do we need to deal so as you know Android device world is like a real zoo 
last time I checked it was over 20,000 different devices. All of them have their different builds, a little hacks. Each, uh, each um, manufacturer has, has done a fork or some kind of changes to the platform. So you never know what it's working. And especially if it's related to locations, you can be sure that there are always some kind of issues. So we try to get them out and then Google also uh, upgrades their system and their stack. So uh, all of that uh, becomes quite a challenging. And then, yeah, of course there are OS versions, then there are different device versions, then there are different screen versions. And uh, in the end, as I said, that plus we can say that there are also our service country and, and these kind of things. So, <coughs> so yeah, it's, it's pretty colorful world to, to handle and, and uh, release stuff. Um, yeah, I think I mainly covered that part. So we, we have like three or four levels of testing and depending of how critical the features are, we do it more thoroughly and, and uh, we, we roll out gradually. And uh, today, yeah, we have hundreds of thousands of customers out there to, to support. So, so yeah, that's how we do it. Then regarding the driver application, so the main, of course, as I said, the drivers are not very tech savvy guys. They are not geeks as you. So they don't really fancy to check around uh, the smartphone, but for them, it's really a working tool. It's business critical. So it must be simple. And uh, whenever we change something, then tons of people don't understand what have been changing. And of course, if you look at the user pattern, then when you order a taxi, you use it like maybe a few times a week. If you check what driver is doing, they are checking this screen 10 hours a day. So for them, it's, it's much more different. So we need to introduce uh, night views and, and things that uh, in daytime it would work and all, all kinds of different things that you maybe might not even consider when you think of taxi booking. It seems like so easy. I just push a button and the taxi comes. But if you go into the details, it's actually like a bit of science behind all of that. So they need to know how much they have done right. Sometimes they do uh, billing with their company. Sometimes they do billing with us. They need to know how much the rides are failing and uh, what's the rate, what's their user feedback and all of that kind of stuff. So, so like there are tons of things that we all need to package in a really simple way. And, and so these driver simple guys <coughs> could understand and use. Um, as I already said, then most of them got their first email with us. So uh, even so they usually go and buy the phone, then they come to our office and they say that, cool, put Taxify on it. Then you want to download it. Google needs an email address. You need a Gmail address to download apps from Google Play. So you create that, then you help to create them a password and all of that thing. You are quite sure they forget the password. Next time they come, they don't know how to reset it. and, and all of that. So that's, that's all the fun part. So uh, then it's all the notification part so that uh, uh, when, when the taxi is coming, uh, how do they communicate with the customers? How do they find the guy? We have introduced uh, phone numbers so that uh, the customer can call the taxi driver if they see that he's going the wrong way or they are behind the house or the opposite way that if the driver can't find the uh, the customer, they can also call and say that which entrance of the building are you at and, and where, I can, where I can find you. And uh, then of course all the payments, uh, the, the big challenge is that most of the drivers when they are on radio or somewhere else, they try to cheat. So they are halfway driving with you, let's say towards Jurmala, and then they are saying that, uh, okay, I'm free uh, to take the next ride. Then they get an order in the airport but they need to drop the customer to the Urmal and then get back there. So all of these kind of things, which the company is based on radio, they, they can't see that. They think that, okay, the, the driver will be there soon, but if it's all visible on the map, then, uh, then it's a different story. And uh, now when we do in-app payments, it's like really life-changing things for the, for the drivers because they, they can't cheat the system very well. If they stop your ride halfway, and trying to get, catch a new ride, then they see that, okay, that was an in-app payment, so I only get uh, paid for half of my ride. 
So, uh, so that's why we need to coach them actually so they switch on their taxi meter and they switch the app and they finish it all together when you are in the final destination. So then you get the payment and then you get, can take the new ride. So might be not very fair for, uh, for the drivers, but it's much better experience for the customers because if you see guy on a map, you order a taxi, it says he's one kilometer away from you and then you see that the guy starts driving towards the opposite direction. What is he doing? Okay, he's still driving with the previous customer and then needs to drop it off somewhere else. You as a customer, you are not satisfied. You need the driver to come right away because you might be in a hurry. And uh, if, we, if we compare, for example, in Tallinn, then you, an average uh, taxi arri arrival time through the call center is about 10 minutes. Our uh, average arrival time is three minutes. So it's quite a lot of difference because our fleet is so much bigger and uh, just we have so many more close by drivers so the distance to go and pick up the driver or sorry the customer is much more shorter than with the guys with smaller fleet because they just have less cars and they need to drive longer distances and, and longer time to pick up the customer so definitely when we get mature on the marketplace it's also quite clear value proposition for the customer so that you have so much choice of cars next to you that you can significantly get the car within a few minutes, not uh, within 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Yeah, uh, I already told about the learning curve. So yeah, drivers are quite much hassling and uh, we, we try to coach them. Uh, we send them newsletters and all of that. So we show how they are doing. We promote better drivers. We give them bonuses and, and uh, all of that. So we really want to make the marketplace transparent and really help the good drivers to get more jobs and the bad drivers kick them slightly out. So, uh, learnings from our expansion plans. So today we are in eight markets. We plan to open another five, six markets during this year. And uh, we have been learning a lot during the last year when we have expanded. So definitely we need to, or at least what we have learned is that you need to choose the markets very, very carefully. So if you go to wrong market, it's like quite a, quite a big loss. So at first you lose money. Secondly, it's the opportunity and timing cost. So if you want to really be first on the market, you, uh, uh, it's, it's a benefit. But if you go on wrong market that the product market fit is really not there, then you are struggling to get the growth and all of that part. So, so really analyze the market fundamentals. What is your service? What is the value proposition? Is it the same value proposition as in, in other markets? And then how do I communicate that value proposition to, to my customers so that they would understand? So technology wise, you might have exactly the same platform and product, but marketing wise, the messages could be totally different from market to market. So because just the culturally or the historically or the economically, the markets uh, might operate differently. Then uh, local team, of course, if you grow, that's the key. So uh, you, the guy first hire you have, uh, if the guy is cool, you can probably rock on the market. If the guy is bad, then you are failing. So today we have developed a four step hiring process and uh, with after each step we have practical tasks and and uh, and uh, things to really understand what is the person about and are they fitting our culture do they have the skills and all of that part so so definitely if you have that kind of local business and need to expand very carefully choose the people and uh, and try to understand and talk to talk to many people who have done it before so uh, try to learn from others' mistakes, not yours, because it's very expensive and you lose a lot of time if you fail. Then, uh, of course, move fast. So we are in the <coughs> taxi app business, which is quite uh, popular currently globally. There are many players and uh, whoever can grab the market first and take the biggest uh, market share wins that market. So uh, if you go in second or third, you need to pay significantly more to acquire customers to change from one app to another. So, uh, so definitely that's, uh, if that is relevant in your business, then try to move as fast as possible. Uh, product market fit, uh, I a little bit described that already. So uh, yeah, try to understand what works in the market and try to push these kind of features and these kind of value proposition and then 
then make it work. Uh, and uh, then clear goals and team communication. So a um, year ago we had uh, two guys sitting in a kitchen and whatever, information was fluent, everyone knew what everyone was doing. Now we are like over 30 people, we are in eight countries and uh, it is a bit of a challenge to get all the people aligned, know the company goals, know what features we are developing, know why you are, we are developing them, why you are rolling back some of the features. So the guy, we just had a case that one guy sold the feature to a corporate customer, the next day we rolled back the feature because it didn't work really well. So all of these kind of things to, to keep the whole team alive and uh, aligned and really also uh, a team feeling and all of that part, that's, that's something we are hustling and uh, trying to figure out how to make that work and, uh, and really to make sure that everyone's like putting 120% in their uh, in their daily effort and they are doing really the smart things, not just doing something that um, already failed in some markets and we know that it fails again. So sharing the knowledge and uh, experience and all of that part is, is critical to really grow and grow fast. Yeah, that's all. So um, thanks a lot. I hope, uh, I hope that you if that if you happen to be in those countries, you can try Taxify. We try to provide similar kind of service uh, everywhere. So our goal is that w whenever you order a taxi from Taxify, it should be a cool car. If it's not, give feedback uh, and the user ratings, driver ratings in the end. Do we really monitor and take it very seriously? We coach the drivers and work hard. So uh, definitely each member of the, of the marketplace is really important for us. So good drivers, good customers and lots of feedback, that all makes the marketplace work. So uh, thanks and yeah, if you have any questions later on, you can contact me here, but if you have questions now, I'm really happy to answer. Yeah. How many times does it pass from the JFS smartphone and it takes the right? How many? Uh, the ribbon. Uh, How much time is it required for the uh, In average? I think, uh, probably between five and seven minutes, probably. We have about uh, 500 drivers currently in Riga, so, uh, so, and yeah, we are growing quite fast now, so hopefully within the next uh, few months will be the biggest fleet, uh, fleet in Riga, so you should have the widest choice of cars. Yeah, please. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think we are in a bit different segment so that we are working with licensed taxis. Uber is putting every car to drive the taxi. So uh, we, uh, we try to beat on the, on the pricing level. And uh, also we see that uh, the advantages that Uber has in the Western world where the taxis are really expensive. Uh, there is a clear value proposition that uh, Uber comes to the market with cheaper prices. But if you look at Riga and uh, consider that taxi costs about 30 cents an average price without any campaign, then you calculate the car price, gasoline price and all of that, it's quite uh, not impossible to really go much cheaper than the prices are today. So uh, we see that the Uber's value proposition here is not that strong. So definitely we are... Uh, we know that they are coming, but we try to be prepared and uh, we try to have the best fleet, uh, all the payments and, uh, and also the pricing be attractive. So, and of course, we try to be first on the market and win most customers. So that's how we see it in Eastern Europe, but in Western Europe, we know that they definitely have advantage and, and their biggest advantage there is pricing because taxis are usually quite expensive and they try to make it cheaper. So uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting challenge and we are already fighting in Helsinki and, uh, and Amsterdam. So we... So how are you uh, it's challenging. <laughs> so um, we have in, in Amsterdam, we have needed to change a bit our business model there. As I said, that uh, choose the markets wisely. So we went into the market, but uh, initially we were not that smart and we found out that uh, in Amsterdam quite many users are tourists and locals are taking taxis uh, not that much. 
So we are now focusing uh, more on the business sales and business customer sales and uh, trying to get more rights from that side and uh, then uh, the consumer market is coming after that. So we need to really adapt uh, in different markets and to see how to make it work. Yeah. No, uh, that hasn't been the plan. Why we chose AdCash was that uh, we use their advertising network to, uh, and knowledge to actually get the best uh, price for our advertising and, and installs. So that has been the site. So we don't plan to put uh, advertising in there. Yeah. When do you plan to have a return of investment? Uh, to be break even? Uh, it depends really of the state of the cities, so uh, in some cities uh, we are profitable, in some cities we are getting uh, close by and in some cities we are still early stage and growth phase. So yeah, if we would only keep the cities, uh, shut down all the non-profitable cities, we could be profitable today, but as we have a vision to expand and cover the bigger area, then of course we are currently spending more than we earn. Sure, uh, yeah, I don't know how much you know the taxi market, but in many Western European markets, historically, the, the license of taxi uh, driver costs about 250,000. So there are companies who have hundreds of these licenses, and if there is now a threat that the value of these licenses would get away, for them it's like real estate. So basically you have a flat, and then tomorrow someone comes to the market and says that your flat is worth like one euro. So how do you feel about that? They are not very happy. So, uh, so definitely, uh, uh, yeah, in this kind of situation, there is strong fight against that. And Uber is currently banned in, uh, I think, five biggest European countries. So Spain, France, uh, Germany, Netherlands, and, uh, and uh, Belgium, I think. So probably in some others more. But of course, they are also doing strong lobby to allow that and, uh, and uh, yeah there must be some kind of innovation because the taxi industries in many markets have been stagnant for like tens of years. There hasn't been any change. And uh, what we see is that uh, we also try to make the market more transparent because currently in most cases, uh, taxi companies don't have any clue how their uh, drivers are doing. So it really must be a raping case or something, I don't know, a really big, big problem when you actually take a phone and call to the dispatcher and say that something was wrong with my ride. In our case, in the end of the ride, you can actually do two clicks or one click to rate the driver and the feedback goes back right away. So uh, this is the first thing we, we make the whole market transparent and taxi companies actually really like that because first time they see how the drivers are doing, what's the feedback, who are the good guys and who are not. So, so uh, in that sense, we are, we are helping the market. The question uh, how, um, how we uh, started and, and why we chose license taxis, I think initially we, we were not considering this private hire or private individuals uh, offering. But if we see that the legislation would allow that in some point in the future, maybe we'll do that. So technology wise, we don't need anything else. We can just sign up the people, uh, give them the smartphone and they are ready to go. So it's mostly just the, the uh, perception, making sure that the quality is good. It must be really strong background check and all of that so that not wrong guys would, would take you. So you probably don't want criminals to take you around or whatever. 
send uh, your children driving with taxis with the guys you don't know. So, uh, so yeah, in that sense, uh, I think market is going towards that way and uh, we'll see how the legislation goes. And if the opportunity comes up and we see that we have a good way to mix it with uh, license taxis and so-called ride sharing, we are probably also open to that. So, uh, so yeah, we, we will see what customers demand, what they like and how to be competitive. We, we are open to new opportunities. Yes, actually uh, we are currently preparing for example Paris, so uh, we, if things go fine we might be live there in May. So, uh, and we have partners in Spain and uh, Germany we are not considering but there are definitely big markets that we are looking for and where we see big demand from, uh, from uh, taxi companies uh, to work with us because most of the other apps they try to take only single drivers and they, uh, the taxi companies are seeing that uh, they are pushed really out of the market. So that is why we see an opportunity that we can provide tools to taxi companies to improve their service, to be more modern and, uh, and be competitive with all the other apps. So, so definitely that's, that is one of our niche opportunities that we are, we are trying to push. Yes, please. Um, we had this vision quite right away, so we knew that we were building international companies, so we built the product to be easily localizable and, and all of that part. And, uh, and uh, if in December, January, basically the new year last year, we saw in Tallinn that the growth was there and we, we found first uh, product market fit, then right away we started to look for for next countries and, uh, and expansion. So we never have planned to be in Estonia because as you might know, we are a small country and that's not, uh, not the place to really build a big business. So you can build a nice lifestyle business if me and my brother would keep the business in Tallinn, I think we would live quite well, but uh, we have bigger goals and ambitions to do stuff in life. So. So that's why from, from the start we, we had ambition to, to go international and that's maybe short late and of course we have learned a lot during the year and, uh, and yeah, it has been like hell of a ride. You started in each location, you started from scratch? Yes. Of course we had connections, so yeah, I have done many businesses and, and uh, with Garage 48 or startup communities and things like that, uh, I have in LinkedIn probably close to 3000 connections and, uh, and all of that, so that all helps, but, but if you take at, uh, if you look at our marketplace thing, so uh, we are really, uh, we really need to start uh, from scratch basically. Uh, so if you see that part, so whenever we have a running business in Tallinn, we come to Riga, we need to start from, from uh, ground up. We need first 10 drivers, we need first 100 customers, and that's in every city. I can't copy Tallinn to Riga, I can't copy Riga to Vilnius. So that's the thing of marketplace. You need to start everywhere ground up uh, and, uh, and be that balanced. Of course, you can copy some uh, experiences, you can learn from some stuff, but in every market you need to uh, build it uh, locally. So of course, if you are eBay or maybe some more online business that the offline part is not th that important, but in our case, we really have guys in cars driving on the streets, real old school offline business. So in that sense, for us opening a new market, every market is new. So, and uh, we really need to make every market work. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, oh, oh, actually, everybody can take taxi. <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> so now we can.